Welcome to Quilting on the Side, the podcast where we uncover the secrets to turning your passion for quilting into a profitable side hustle. I'm Tori from the Quilt Batch by Tori. And I'm Andy from True Blue Quilts. And together, we're your co-hosts on this exciting journey of creativity, entrepreneurship, and all things quilting. We're here to help you navigate the world of quilt pattern design, course creation, digital marketing, and running an online quilt business. We've been through the ups and downs ourselves, so we know what it takes to make money from your favorite hobby. That's right, Tori. We're going to share our experiences on how we've grown our businesses while balancing family with other paying work responsibilities. It's not always easy, but it's definitely possible. Welcome back to Quilting on the Side. We are super excited tonight to talk to our friend Becky from So Forever. And I'm just going to let you take it away, Becky. Tell us how you got started quilting and when it became a business. Okay. Um, I've been crafting for years, like when I was young. And I probably began sewing when I was 14. <clears throat> but there was no home economics class in any of the schools that I went to. Or if you chose college prep, you weren't allowed to take a home economics class. I learned to sew a bit from my mom, but she wasn't like that friendly of a teacher. <laughs> so I was better off just trying to learn what I could. And so um, I learned a bit from her. And then I progressed to making prom dresses and later my wedding gown. And then um, I had... Um, my own household. So then I made curtains and pillows and whatever the household needed. Mm -hmm. No one in my family were quilters. So um, I took my first quilting class in the early 90s. And as a mother of three children, I was looking for a creative project that I could pick up between the busy moments of my life. The first introduction Quilting connected with me profoundly. I love the process of creating something practical and beautiful and the sense of accomplishment that it brings. I kept going back, learning more and more about quilting. Um, when I did other crafts, it was just, a, it was another project and it was another kit or whatever. With quilting, it was like, there are so many different ways to quilt that all these years, I still have things to learn. <clears throat> so um, my business started in two different ways. I attended a quilt presentation at the Ohio Historical Center, and the presenter was talking about how they preserved their quilts, folding the quilts with tissue paper to help prevent permanent um, folds, and periodically refolding them in a different direction. And the question struck me, why are they storing quilts folded? So I was determined to find a better way to store quilts. And I designed a quilt storage sleeve made out of Tyvek because it's archival, breathable, and water resistant. I made and sold those quilt storage sleeves on my website for 15 years. So that was the beginning of my business. And um, the quilt sleeves would protect your quilts forever. And so that's where my name came from. So forever. Mm -hmm. And then Tyvek became so expensive. I could no longer make the sleeves and sell them at a reasonable price point. So because meanwhile, Tyvek, I'm taking, let me, let me interrupt for just a second. That's like the parachute material. It's like uh, what they put on houses to put before they put on the siding. Oh, okay. Um, but you, I could buy Tyvek from uh, material concepts out of, I think they were out of Pennsylvania in big rolls. And, 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 and it was a specific one for archival stuff. So Tyvek wasn't printed all over it. Do you know what I mean? It was just, they were just white. So. And how did you even come up with that material? Had you encountered it somewhere else and just knew it would apply or? I did, I researched. Oh, okay. I researched what is breathable and water resistant, sewable, and and that and that's how I found Tyvek. That's great. So, yeah, yeah, and um, so th that served a purpose for for a long time. 
meanwhile, I'm taking classes and exploring all different kinds of quilting. And one of the quilt guilds that I belong to hosted a famous quilter twice a year. And I have a very long list of teachers that I had the pleasure of learning from. They inspired me to want to teach something in the quilting world. However, I had not found my expertise yet. I came across uh, uh, beautiful table rounds. Mm -hmm. I was in a class, naturally. You know me, Andy. I'm always <laughs> taking classes. And I uh, met her there, and she had these four table rounds, which were seasonal. And I fell in love with the patterns. They were just so gorgeous. So they were applique patterns. And I knew I had to master applique, no matter how intimidating it seemed. But learning, the learning co curve was frustrating. And I struggled to get my applique precise. And I started to worry that I wasn't going to produce something that was worthy of displaying. Mm -hmm. I took lots of classes, but it just wasn't working for me until it occurred to me that the traditional method might not be the only way. I broke from tradition and started experimenting with methods to achieve the same results with less difficulty. After months of experimentation, laying in bed at night thinking, how can I do this differently? I developed what's now called innovative applique, which are time-saving techniques that make turned edge applique really easy. You're not tracing templates or uh, a placement guide or needle turn or cutting freezer paper from the back of your project. You can achieve precise results without hours or years of practice. Plus, I came, well, I didn't come across it, but developed a really um, super simple way to do the printo that creates dimension for your applique. Having created an applique, now I wanted to teach the process. And I approached my local quilt shop and requested that I could teach innovative applique. My first class um, at that shop was based on a free pattern from Quilter's newsletter, which is no longer in print. The owner advised me that they would like a pattern that they could sell versus a free pattern that we were working from. <clears throat> um, and that's what led me to pattern design. A member of one of the guilds that I belong with belonged to had fabulous drawings. I mean, she was drawing all the time. And she had this whole um, notebook full of these drawings of these flowers. And I'm like, oh, my God, Bobby, I would love to make quilt pattern designs out of those. And she's like, yeah, that's fine. And to be fair to her, I was like, let me buy the, the, the rights to these designs from you. So she sold me the rights. And that's um, where I... Um, created my first quilt, Plant Your Own Garden, because they're fantasy flowers. Um, so Plant Your Own Garden, which was later, well, later became a book that was published by American Quilter Society. And um, another artist, because I'm not really a good drawer, so there's different ways to go about things to get that accomplished. And you're really familiar with my Christmas pattern because mm -hmm. we collaborated on that um, project. but. Another artist created drawings based on the ideas that I had. Mm. I want this, I want a soldier, I want an angel and all of that. And I bought the rights to her drawings and that became my second book with American Quarter Society. How did I end up with book deals? Because that's kind of, I think, an interesting thing for people to know. Um, I made each individual flower as a small quilt sample and then made all 12 flowers again as the plant your own garden quilt. And I rented a booth at Quilt Market in May of 2012 when it was, because every other year, it, it's always in Houston and then every mm -hmm. other year it circulates to something somewhere else. At least that's the way it used to be. And this one was in Kansas City. It's an expensive endeavor. Mm -hmm. The booth cost, the flights, I flew my daughter out to help me. And everything in the booth had to be shipped to Kansas City because you can't get everything that goes into that booth packed into a suitcase. And I was working at a quilt shop part time and making the quilt um, sleeves, and that's how I paid for all of that. 
Um, I did not get very many pattern orders standing at my booth with all the different uh, shop owners going through. And um, I was like, oh, gosh, this is so disappointing. And on the last day, um, um, American Quilter Society came up to my booth and said, um, would you be interested in a book deal? And I was like, oh, my God. Yes, I would. So I'd, I'd never written a book. And, um, but I would say that writing a book for a quilt pattern is, I, I already had all the dire- directions and that sort of stuff. So it wasn't like, you know, I have to come up with a plot or anything. It's, mm-hmm. it's a quilt pattern and you just put it in book form. So that was, that was good. So um, American Quilter Society, after me, um, after they published my book, they flew me to Denver to tape a class about innovative applique. And um, I, so, and then it was like a, a lot of things came together kind of at once and it kind of snowballed because of what was going on. And I was a guest on the clothing art show that's hosted by Susan Brubaker Knapp. And um, it was series 1600 episode 1611. And, um, then I was at Houston Quilt Market 2014 and 15, where my book was being um, featured by American Quilter Society. So, you know, I'd be in the booth to talk about it for a certain amount of time. But um, you didn't have to have your own booth. So those later. No, I didn't have to have my own booth, but I did pay for my own transportation and right. staying and all that. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't cover that. So, um, um, so then I traveled to various um, American Quilter Society shows and um, to promote the the book. And um, Plant Your Own Garden actually ended up in Joanne Fabrics. So one day I'm in Joanne Fabrics, which I don't shop for clothing material there, but was there for something else. And my book was there. So I have a picture of that, which was like really exciting. That is and exciting. the book. Yeah. The book is no longer in print, and I'm working on turning it into a pattern. That was my big reason for taking Elizabeth's um, pattern writing class, which I've taken three times and still <laughs> still don't have it in a pattern. <laughs> but you know, so my second book, uh, I just made a proposal to American Quilter Society because I already had a relationship with them for the Christmas characters, and that became they named the book which is a mouthful, holly, jolly, ornamental, applique. <laughs> it's like, you don't get to pick your cover, you don't get to pick your title, but you get a book, you know. And so not long after that, American Quilter Society decided to get out of publishing, at least for a while. I think they publish now. And so the book didn't get the backing that the first one had. And um, they had this deal where they were just going to sell off your book at like extremely discounted rates or just give them away. So I made the decision to buy like the 50 books they had, which in hindsight has not been a good decision because the promotion is not behind the book. You know, I promote it myself, but I still have 45 copies. (laughs) So, you know, some, 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 um, like honesty or whatever transparency about how sometimes things work out. Yeah, yeah. So um, over the years, most of my profit um, profitable revenue um, has come from vending at local and national quilt shows um, and teaching at guilds. That was for a while the main money makers for me. Now, is that Um, teaching in person or virtually? Yeah, because in my day, there was no virtual. Do you know what I mean? It Mm -hmm. was like everything was everything was in person. So I would go to various shows and rent a booth. And some were like small booths. Not all were, you know, like I, I don't I don't know if I ever. Well, besides Kansas City, I didn't I I signed up to go back to Quilt Market and Um, I think it was in Pittsburgh, but that was when the pandemic happened. And so then that was, that was the last of it, but little, you know, little cold shows, bigger shows, whatever. And I could, 
demonstrating the innovative applique, I would just have like crowds around my booth. And then I had, I had patterns, I had supplies, and that was very lucrative um, time for, for my business. So now, how far were you, see. Becky, were you <clears throat> traveling? Were, were you trying to stay there? You told us you were in Ohio. So did you stay in that kind of Midwest area or did you go coast to coast wherever there were shows? Mm, I'm thinking about that. Um, I mean, some of it was, uh, some of it was, sorry, my dog, mm -hmm. some of it was coast to coast, but that was more with AQS, mm -hmm. American Quilter Society. But then um, traveling were more like surrounding um, states because I had, I had, a, or guilds. So I had a good amount of um, demand that I could fill not really locally, but you within know, driving close. distance, I guess it was that you weren't like packing yeah. up and, and flying across the country all the time. No, no, okay. no, I that that's exactly right. Yeah, so um, I do, I did want to say that when the uh, American Quilter Society flew me to Denver to tape the innovative applique class, I did get a considerable kind of like advance mm -hmm. and. Over the years, I get statements as to how much they've, how many times they've sold that class to equal out. And honestly, I think they've just kind of like phased it out. I was really close. I mean, I used to do the math. I'm like, oh, only four hundred more dollars or something mm -hmm. like that to equal it out. But, um, but my contract did say that I could teach it other places. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I did that. You know. Um, and then, um, let's see. So the, the class is still available on their website as innovative applique. And then, as you know, with the help of, um, the Academy for virtual teaching, I created my own innovative applique on demand class. That's two hours of exactly what it's all about. And, um, then. It covers the entire process. So I love teaching to enable people to increase their skills. I've had people in class that have been like the total beginners that were just beginning. And then they were brave enough to take an applique class. And they were like, this is insane. I didn't realize it could be this easy. And so that makes me really happy because I don't want things to be to be so hard it you know you you everybody can pretty much do it so um but like the the in-person teaching i didn't love packing it up and not knowing where i was not not that i didn't know where i was staying but a lot of times you're in small towns and it's like oh gosh i hope i'm safe in this hotel here you know so um i have I'm not like some people love to travel. I don't. And um, so I've switching to virtual and trying to, it's been a really hard transition money wise because I can't sell everything virtually that I sold when I was in person and showing you exactly what to do with that product in the sense of, you know, anyway, so that gets harder. Um, so, um, books, patterns, and products sell at a very small profit margin as, as you guys mm -hmm. know. So it's become, it's become difficult to really have much of a, much of an income now. I do still teach locally. Like I have a class in March that I'm teaching, but I thought applique would be my area of expertise until English paper PC became so popular on Instagram or wherever. And um, once again, the traditional method of basting, gluing, whip stitching, and pulling papers did not appeal to me. So I constantly asked the question, what te technique can I make more doable? And this question led to English paper PC made easy it's 
also known as English, English Paper PC Made Modern because that was its first name. And um, based on Elizabeth's recommendations, I rebranded it, which rebranding is a bit of a nightmare, but <laughs> <laughs> it hopefully speaks to better as to what it does. So um, the English Paper PC, I have that little thing here. Oh, here it is. Are just self stick templates that um, stick on your fabric. And so there is, there's, there's um, nothing to base glue or whip stitch. You just put right sides together and stitch along the and stitch along the template. And it, it's, it's so different and so easy. It's amazing. I can, like, like English paper piecing is a lot about cutting certain motifs out. And I can cut that exact motif out as many times as I have fabric to cut it without putting a acrylic template down and tracing around the image or whatever. It's just like once this sticker goes down, I can repeat that motif over and over and over. It's 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 insanely easy. And so um, and the stickers are reusable. Um, I say five to 10 times, but I, I think one of the uh, downfalls is that I had somebody who uh, purchased my product and I saw her in a local quilt shop recently. And she's like, I love the product. She goes, I can use them over and over and over. She goes, but, but that's kind of bad for you because I don't need to buy more, you know, <laughs> but anyway, so um, um and then I, I created um, blank sheets so that you can, like, if, if there's not a package of templates that you want for what you're doing, you can um, make your own templates, either by tracing or printing something out. Like, I'm doing the um, uh, Tulip Pink Block of the mm -hmm. Month Queen of Diamonds, and I bought the templates because, well, one, I couldn't, there, the math was... These are not normal size shapes. And so I bought the paper templates and I traced them out on the blank sheets and I we're on month eight. And so I've sewn this whole thing by uh, machine. And I, I'm not against hand sewing, but there are so many people who, who can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so this opens up English paper piecing to, to so many people, which makes me really happy about. So yeah, your you, uh, templates, Becky, inspired me to start a hexy project. So go ahead, go ahead. The, the templates are easy. The the following the colors of the paper diagram are what's tripping me up at the moment. Is to trying to stay organized with which colors come next. Yeah. yeah. What made you well, think of a What made you think of a sticker? That's really well, interesting. Well, thank you for asking because. You know what I did? I was like, I want something that doesn't have to be, uh, that can be moved uh, moved around. And I literally started with post notes. And post it notes were not, like, they didn't have enough sticky enough mm -hmm. up on them, and they weren't thick enough. So the paper that I print these stickers on, or the, like, the blank sheets, have to be a certain weight paper, because you're using your out of quarter ruler and it butts up against the side of it, and then you just cut everything out with your rotary cutter. And so you need to have that certain weight, one, for reusability, and two, so that it will hold your ruler in place for you to, to get the cut you want. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, so I I'm in the process. I'm asking questions about how to how to come up with easier and, you know, better ways to do things. Just, you know, that, that questioning of, well, I know this is how everyone else has done it, but I need to try something a little different. That's just amazing and brilliant and wonderful for all oh. of us that are a little bit intimidated by some of these techniques. Well, thank you. Thank you. And like I said to you today, I posted to mm -hmm. you today about I feel like it's like um, Rebecca Bryant isn't, mm -hmm. I think that is the freezer paper person, which mm -hmm. freezer paper is so much different than English paper piecing. But 
I took her class and it was like, oh my God, this is genius. This is nothing like freezer paper that, that I'd been taught before, you know, mm -hmm. and I used her method to, um, Jay Bird did the, mm -hmm. um, the trip around the world block of the month, mm -hmm. uh, two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And so she did the freezer paper traditional way. And since I'd learned from, um, Rebecca, um, I did the entire quilt like Rebecca taught me and, and that speaks to, it works perfectly well. Cause I mean, they were teeny tiny mm -hmm. things and you think, oh, well maybe it'll work for this, but that's going to be too complicated. It's mm -hmm. yeah. I'm drawn to, okay, let me feel successful about this without, without spending years learning how to do this sure. or wasting time pulling papers or you know tracing templates when we have printers we can just mm -hmm. print templates yeah you know? can, I, um, can i bring you back to that product development stage when you thought of you're using post-its and then you want to create stickers so how did you find the weight and the right kind of paper and i'm just so curious on how you got these manufactured well, um, actually, that product started with Checker. I went to Checker um, Distributors, and let's see. I'm trying to think about – oh, I was putting, like, label paper together, doubling it up so I could get the thickness of it. And um, I ended up going to Checker, and we worked on the project together. And um, – it used to be called Stitch Fast. And they actually found the first paper for me that was not labeled stuck together. Mm -hmm. And that came out of California and they don't make that paper anymore, which is so sad on my part because it was extremely expensive, but it was, ex I, it, I loved it. So then Checker um, agreed to say, take this and run with it because um it requires uh, as you probably know a little bit of education about how to use it um and that's why i have youtube videos showing you know how how to use it so once um the paper that um uh, checker found was no longer available then i had to source another paper and um you know i have to buy like 2000 sheets of it at a time which is painful, but the plus side is it's it's a lot less expensive than what the other papers were. So that's how that's how that came about. So, so you guys ask questions because <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> you were so so recap for us your current offerings you've got your uh english paper piecing do you have classes virtual classes for that yet or just the innovative applique just the innovative applique right now the um english paper piecing is my next um one to tape and it's part of the hesitation has been i have to decide what platform to put that on mm. and um I don't remember creative creative spark spoke with it was it was lyric right that creative spark had that so. presentation yeah and so um I've contacted them about innovative applique and because you don't have to pay for the platform even though they take 50 percent it still seems like a, like a really good deal. Plus they're doing a lot of marketing for you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, that's one of the options that I want to do. And the other thing that I'm struggling with and, and Andy and Tori, mm -hmm. you guys are so much better at tech because you're so much more younger than me. <laughs> um, and I want to be able to have the classes on my website because I think a lot more people would buy them because they're they're going there to look at my products. Um, oh, one thing I want to remember to say too. So they're going there to look at my products, and it would just be a lot easier to find the class if it 
were on my website. So mm-hmm. I don't know how to do the tech part so that they can buy it on my website and, and get access to it. Because mm-hmm. my kind of like fear is that I'll put it up there and it won't work right. And then that's going to be bad, you know? So, so just <laughs> to kind of close the loop and answer that question and, and Tori, you, you have much more experience with courses. So is it, it what, what's, what has been your solution for hosting a, a course that someone goes to your website and purchases? Yeah, I think having it on your website, as you're saying, is probably a great way to go. Um, Creative Spark can be really handy, especially if you are not comfortable marketing. Um, But they do, as you said, they take 50%. So it's just weighing uh, pros and cons of how much time you're willing to put in for marketing versus um, having someone else kind of help with that. Uh, What is your what is your website? What's your platform? It's so forever.com. Yeah, but is it like a WordPress or Wix or? Oh, it's yeah, Shopify. I could have that question oh, better. Okay. Uh, That's sh- okay. It's Shopify. Yeah. It's Shopify. And you create a pro- creative, creative spark. You can have that class there and you can have it anywhere else. But the thing I'm trying to avoid is paying for a platform. Like my innovative applique class is on New Zendler platform because mm-hmm. I got one free listing from taking the uh, Academy of Virtual Teaching. Mm-hmm. So I, it's a free listing, but I, I don't really love the site because I don't get communication from people who take the class. I don't, mm-hmm. they're, they're like somewhere far away and I don't get notification if they need help or whatever, or mm-hmm. like feedback, any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, you know, do I pick like Thinkrific or, I don't want to pay $600, $800 for another platform. I just want to incorporate it into my um, website. Yeah. Does that Um, make sense? Because the, the, my immediate reaction and suggestion and what I've been toying with for uh, my potential classes is that you make a, I guess it would be an unlisted video on YouTube and then you put an email trigger to send out, drip out the content. And Tori's shaking her head like, no, that's not the good way to you do can. it. You can. So that's a way. Um, but they <laughs> do, you're able to share it from YouTube. Mm-hmm. And then you don't own that platform. So if YouTube goes down at any point, I mean, that's a risk you have with almost any platform, mm-hmm. but you don't own YouTube. Um so that's that's why I shake right. I'm like, yeah, that might mm-hmm. not be the best way. Um, you may think about choosing, and I know it's a big a big thing to say, but a different platform. Um, Shopify may not be the best platform for course creation. Shopify is uh, product based, um, as is my understanding. Um, I went with Wix because it did have other options within it. Um, but there are all kinds, as you know, there are all kinds. Um, so maybe looking into a different platform, which I know is a huge ask for that. Um, but yeah, I, that's what I would do is look for um, a host that can do everything for you. It sounds like New Zendler is not doing everything for you. It sounds like Shopify is not doing everything for you um, that you need. So that would be my advice is to look for a different platform and then work on. And you can even do this slowly where I know that with many platforms, you can open up what you need on that platform that you're missing from the old one and then slowly open more within that platform as you close down the other one. I think that's good advice. I uh, um, <clears throat> Another friend of mine from another class um, she's thrilled about Wix. Um, the whole DMARC thing, you know, with the email situation and Google, um, I could not get GoDaddy to help me at all because that's where my domains are. And um, I had to pay somebody to do it because I, I was spending hours and hours trying to make it work where um, uh, she uses Wix and they did everything for her. So mm-hmm that's some it's good advice to look into yeah Yeah. um and and just because tori and i may not you know maybe younger doesn't necessarily mean we don't have tech issues either so definitely uh, reach out and you know find find that support um 
to help you solve those problems because that's the the great thing about um well about the internet like you had said you have years of researching to find answers for for your the questions and and the solutions you need um and and you can do that in most all areas of your business as well what have where have you found the best marketing efforts and you know speak to the the eternal struggle i feel like that we have as solopreneurs and you know trying to get the word out about our uh our products and our offers right and you know i don't mind marketing at all i kind of enjoy it but my favorite tools for that are canva canva's in i it's insane it is so so good i do have canva pro and i kind of think you need it to if you're going to really use it a lot which i do and then um my other favorite tool for social marketing is is later because I can go into later. It's a, it's a, let's see, what would you say? It's a, it's a place I can post and I can post to like, I have like the bottom tier, not bottom, but you know, not just like the entry level tier. So, um, and I can't remember what it, it, it is per year, but I can go in there and post to three social sets to, to eight, one social set, which my social set is, um instagram facebook and pinterest Mm -hmm. and now they've added shorts which is you're so good at shorts i'm still (laughs) figuring shorts out but i can go in there and post like put a drop a picture in and i can go from canva to later directly Mm -hmm. i just learned how to do this and um so i can write one post and post to three different um platforms and it's all and it's all scheduled out so Mm -hmm. i'm you know i feel like i'm their cheerleader because i'm constantly telling people they're like oh i can't post all this stuff it's like well if you have later you you because on a sunday night i'll just i'll because lots of people say oh you know you you need your pillars you need all this and it's like i kind of don't have pillars in the sense we're always making things. And mm-hmm. as we're making things, we're posting about them. I can't plan out like a month's worth of stuff because I don't know what I'm making in a month. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, on a Sunday night, I can drop uh, photos in that I think are interesting and helpful for people and, and you know, create the, the post, schedule it out so that, I mean, I can schedule as, as far out as I want, but I don't feel like my business is best served i schedule out for a week Mm -hmm. and then okay now i'm working on something else let me let me share what i can help you with this week you know but if i had to do it every single day it just doesn't happen so and the fact that like i said about tech um it is so easy to use Mm -hmm. you just the, the photos just drop in you click on them up they come and there's a lot of really positive things to be able to that's my best marketing and mm. it, it also goes to pinterest and and print pinterest does drive traffic to my website mm. most of my um purchases will ha- mm. come from pinterest yeah yeah um i i'm getting the the nudge from the universe to get back on Pinterest. It's one of those things that uh, I I can't stay consistent on that because I've got so many other things and places that I am, but uh, definitely need right. to to do that. Um, and as Tori has taught me, you start with one or two platforms and then you slowly branch out. And anytime you can repurpose, uh, it's it's great and. So that's what I do with shorts. When I put out a long YouTube video, I just go back in and I try to cut those 15 to 60 second clips 
and and send those to the other platforms that like mm -hmm. video too so uh, yeah yeah and and now you can do those in later which mm -hmm. is what i'm i i got to figure out how to make the clips <laughs> <laughs> then I can make up a, I can make a folder, put a whole bunch of clips in, and then I could just post like crazy to shorts. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like using um, the app called CapCut, C A P C U T, to mm -hmm. clip my videos and to to edit them into the right format and stuff. So, uh, just a little plug for one of those free apps because um, I do everything from my phone. Uh, unless it, obviously longer form video stuff I do on the computer. But sure. um, so another question um, and I have to pause because I had it and then I, uh, I lost it. Yeah. Oh, I know what it was classes because you and I have kind of been, you know, perpetual students oh, and always feeling we need to learn the next, you know, obviously this next teacher is going to have the secret sauce to make me blow up. What classes have you found the most beneficial? Would you recommend to other people starting out their business? I would recommend, um, well, if they want to teach, um, the Academy for Virtual Teaching is, it came about out of need because of the pandemic and has developed into something incredibly wonderful. And the support and learning and information in there enabled me to do Innovative Advocate on my own here, you know. So that that is my, that's a really big one. Um, then uh, Craft Industry Alliance, I've learned lots from them. And it is um, a great way to connect with other people in the community. And um, like they did, you could do the mastermind in there. So we could break up into small groups and choose a topic you wanted to work on. And so... I've done masterminds before and they weren't always like wonderful because they weren't sp specific about what you were doing. So it was kind of like all over the board. And this mastermind class is on um, social media. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's, we're, we're planning on um, like collaborating with each other because there are people in different fields, like sewing, like, sewing clothes mm -hmm. is different than quilting but craft industry alliance for all the education they provide is is a really i've been with them for a very long time i think since the beginning and yeah. that's a really good place and then virtual teaching um i do still like um Where'd be me? I could go down the laundry list. I think YouTube. I have, YouTube. have been in so um, many of the same yeah, online I'm spaces. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about um, Patchwork with oh, Shannon I, Brinkley. No, no, no. Um, Trina Little the, on you, YouTube. Trina Little. Yeah, yeah. She was Trina Little been helpful over the years in how to do YouTube. Mm -hmm. I'm. I'm thinking about, do I need the $37 class she's offering right now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's funny how those dollar amounts have changed over the years. You know, it used to be, oh, if, if I spend, you know, the $7, do you remember on the internet when you could get some bonus ebook for $7 and now it's like, oh, $37, of course, that's the, that's the throwaway kind of. I all that's an easy yes because it's the low price point, right? Versus the um thousand dollar mm -hmm. class that I'm just really not going to get through, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, those are the kinds of things that have been helpful in me l learning to transition from traveling and all mm -hmm. of that to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Being able to offer things in a different way. Yeah. Well, I just want to commend you for your adaptability in this industry. You know, you said you started 
quilting in the 90s. And for the young folks out there, you know, there was a time when we didn't have internet and we weren't online all day every day. So congratulations on making those changes and adapting your business to uh, survive and thrive well, in these you. new spaces. Uh, that's, well, yeah, that's thank you. Really encouraging because as they say, the only thing constant in life is change. So yeah. uh, I will yeah. mention to our audience that Tori was having some internet problems and so she has dropped out of the call, but I do want to make sure we get those rapid fire questions in that we oh, ask yay. our guests. So um, what color do you struggle to include in your quilts? Yellow. Really? And That's here's my big yellow flower behind right me. Right behind you on the, yeah. on the video portion. Right. Yeah. Um, yellow is, I use it, but it's so funny because three of these flowers mm -hmm. have yellow in them, but flowers are yellow, but mm -hmm. on a, on a normal basis and, and, and just a regular quilt, yellow is the hardest one for me to work into. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's so interesting. Um, and then do you like to work with and design with yardage or pre-cuts? Definitely yardage mm -hmm. because with English paper piecing, pre-cuts are so limited to, to, you know, how many times you're going to be able to get a repeat out of it. Yeah. And, and I, do, I, I do want to tell ahead. people to follow you on social media because you, you have such fun pictures of your fussy cutting and I can see how yardage would be much more conducive to finding those motifs. Right. And you always need like six, eight, ten of them. So, yeah, you need the yardage, you know. So. Good, good. good. And uh, your favorite notion? Go ahead for the be... promotion. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite notion would be the English paper PC made easy. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, I'm just, I had no idea I would go so into this, but I just love it. Yeah, and it, um, like I said, I love seeing your progress photos for your, um, you know, for a while you were sharing just uh, the hexy rosettes and now with the tulip pink diamonds, um, it's just, I, I look forward to your progress updates. And I, as a happy customer, I can attest that the, <laughs> the English paper piecing made easy templates are fabulous, um, especially for those oh, of us who you. are just dipping into that technique. Well, um, thank you. How many quilts are in the room with you right now? Um, well, I have a long arm quilter, and so I store my quilts underneath there, and there's probably probably six under there. And then I have one, two, three, I have two design walls that have stuff on them. So they're not completed quilts. Right. No, I we don't have, have to count those. Just the, the ones that okay. have made it to the binding. So I have this one behind me that I change out all the time with my magnetic holders to put oh, hand nice. quilts. Another one on the other wall. And then a little tiny one that I did for Elizabeth Chadwell's um, Dresden plate thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, fun. So surrounded by, I fortunately have a room that's dedicated to sewing. Yep. Yep. Although I'm sure it's, it uh, tends to take over the house. <laughs> um, no, I keep pretty much everything yeah? up here. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're, you're much more yeah. disciplined than, than I am. <laughs> um, I do. I think I have a quilt in <laughs> every room. Um, what has been the most rewarding part of your business? Um, I guess teaching, but also creating two products that um, make it easy for someone to incorporate a new skill into their um, toolbox without having to spend years mm. to accomplish that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that I'm sure your students would say the same thing that that is very rewarding and uh, beneficial. So uh, thank you for that. And 
we I, always wrap up with who is inspiring you right now? And this doesn't necessarily have to be quilt related, but where do you find inspiration and who's at the top of that list right now? I would say that uh, the quilts are on fire, Brandy, and I can't pronounce her last name, mm -hmm. but um, podcasts are a big inspiration to me. And hers, she interviews the most interesting people in our um, field. Mm -hmm. Just, just amazing. I, and there are people that, like, I went to the um, Columbus Art Museum because they had a quote um, display um, in January. And um, I posted about it the other day. Because I didn't, I, I'd seen a little bit about Luke Haynes, and he's done some fabulous. Like, you look at some at his quilts, and and they look one way, and then you look at them, and they're like show something else. I don't know, but I've only seen like little snippets of it because of shows or something. Mm -hmm. Well, Brandy did a whole interview with him, and I was like, oh my goodness! And I walked into the Columbus Art Museum. And one of his quilts was hanging there. I was like, oh my gosh, I was so, I was so excited to actually get to see one in person. Um, but yeah, she inspires me because she's, and, and it's called Quilter on Fire because she was a firefighter. Oh yeah. So, she has yeah, such an that, interesting story. And, and then you guys inspire me because oh. you are, you know, you're, you're providing an outlet for me and lots of people who may not get on a podcast like that and you're sharing good business tips and and ways to help us do things better so okay. i think that's an amazing feat that you've well taken the you. time with yeah, everything else yeah. you guys do we you know, the, I always say the best part of quilting is the people and the friends that you make. And over the years, I have been so um, happy to see your bright, smiling face when I show up in a class. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. glad we keep interacting that way. So that's been fun. Um, tell folks where, again, where they can find you and what you have coming up here in the next couple months. Okay. Um, they can find me at, let's see, at soforever.com. And it's one word. And um, then on Instagram, because they're all different. Instagram mm -hmm. is at soforever by Becky Campbell. Um, YouTube is soforever by Becky Campbell. And Facebook is soforever quilting by Becky Campbell. And Pinterest is soforever. Mm-hmm. So, so some form or another. And if you go to one, you'll, well, mostly if you go to Instagram mm -hmm. or my website, you'll, there'll be other, there'll be the links so that you don't have to memorize all those different <laughs> combinations of the words. Yep. Yep. And we'll have links to everything in the show notes as well. So uh, it's been wonderful to talk to you tonight, Becky, and we thank you. And we look for more beautiful, uh, applique and paper piecing projects from you well thank you so much i appreciate you guys having me on what a really interesting conversation with becky um this was a really i loved a lot of what she was talking about and andy what was your uh biggest takeaway from our conversation with becky becky kept saying how she wanted to make things easy and doable for beginners. And that's the thing that has stuck with me is that she really did find that easy button for people. And having that curiosity helps with no, you know, no matter what technique, no matter what endeavor she faces next, she, you know, that she'll be able to take that curiosity and question and find an easy way and then be able to teach that to other people. So I think she's got a good formula there. What was your biggest takeaway? Uh, well, it kind of builds on yours, actually. Um, I love that you said easy button. Um, what I what I really took away from her 
from her conversation, our conversation was how she took an idea and she didn't try to do it all of all herself. It kind of reminds me of that funny phrase where you're an adult, but you need to find an adultier adult <laughs> to help you solve a problem. Um, I feel like Becky didn't try to do it all on her own. She went and found a a more professional professional to help her, like a bigger company that could source better to help her with, um, especially I'm thinking of the paper for her mm -hmm. um, sticker, like uh, EPP templates. Um, and I just found that inspirational because I'm one, I'm one of those people that try to do it all myself and then realize I can't and I need to go find, and I don't always know where to go. And it was mm -hmm. really, really interesting to follow her train of thought and how she built out the products that she had in her own mind. I, I, yeah, that was probably my biggest takeaway. Yeah, I just think Becky had some uh, great experiences for our audience, especially if someone has product ideas. That idea of um, doing your research and, and finding people to help is a great tip. So we'd love to hear what our audience finds interesting about these conversations. So please leave a comment. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe in all the places. And we really love a review. So if you're enjoying season two, please go to your podcast platform and leave us a review. Thanks so much. What a great discussion. If you enjoyed this episode of Quilting on the Side, please leave us a review on whichever platform you're listening. It can be iTunes, Spotify, or even our YouTube channel. And hit the subscribe button so you don't miss our next chat. Until then, remember to have fun in your business and do a little quilting on the side.